Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is the seventh and final session in our series discussing the opportunities for tribes in the American Rescue Plan. Today, we will be having a conversation with Dr. Miriam Jorgensen, Chairwoman Kathy Chavers, Chairman Rodney Butler, and President Kevin Killer about how tribes can maximize their American Rescue Plan opportunities. My name is Karen Diver and I serve on the Board of Governors for Honoring Nations. I'm a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School, which is the virtual site of today's program. I formerly served as the chairwoman of the Fond du Lac Reservation and in the Obama White House as Special Assistant to the President for Native American Affairs. I'm currently advising the President of the University of Minnesota. I want to start with a few announcements on behalf of the Ash Center at Harvard, which is the host for today's program. In particular, the Ash Center would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. This event is being recorded and the video will be made publicly available on the Ash Center YouTube channel and through the website of the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development. You are welcome to submit questions anytime throughout today's program. Please use the question and at answer button at the bottom of your screen. Please do not um, use the chat button. We cannot monitor both the chat. Please use the question and answer button. Now I'd like to introduce our distinguished speakers for today. Joining us today is Dr. Miriam Jorgensen. Miriam is research director for the Native Nations Institute at the University of Arizona and for its sister program, the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development. Her areas of specialty are indigenous governance and economic development with a particular focus on the ways communities, governance arrangements and sociocultural characteristics affect development. Rodney Butler is the chairman of the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation, um, where he has served in that role since January 2010. He's been on the Tribal Council since 2004. He presently serves as co-chairman of the Board of Directors for MMCT LLC and is a board member for Foxwoods El San Juan Casino. Kathy Chavers has served the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa for over 30 years, focusing on healthcare before shifting her career to politics. In 2008, she was elected the District 1 representative for the Boys Fort Reservation Tribal Council, and in April 2016, she was elected tribal chairwoman. She also currently serves as the first female president of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe among her service on various boards at the local and national level. Kevin Killer is a youth activist, Native American politician, and president of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. Kevin served 10 years in the South Dakota legislature, representing a district that included the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. He is a co-founder of the Advanced Native Political Leadership. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us today. Um, we appreciate your willingness to share um, your expertise and governance, as well as your communities. Um, process um, and looking at how to use research or ARPA funds, excuse me. Miriam, you've co-authored research on per capita distributions as it relates to tribal revenues. Can you set the table for us today and frame policy considerations and what, what might be the requirements for different spending plans? Thanks so much, Karen. Um, I think that it's useful when we start a conversation like this to actually step back a little bit. And um, uh, Melissa, can you go to the next slide, please? And think a little bit about what the huge advantages of the American Rescue Plan Act are. One of the um, characteristics that it has that um, I think many other past expenditures on in Indian country and on native issues and concerns haven't had is its incredible flexibility. It's a great recognition of sovereignty and self-determination of tribes. Uh, there's a lot of uh, authority and decision-making authority that uh, tribes have over these funds. But that also raises, in a sense, a, a problem for tribes. That flexibility, the ability to exercise sovereignty and self-determination over many of these monies, particularly those monies that are coming through treasury, means that Native nations are faced with competing priorities. There's a tension between the kinds of things that one um, might wanna spend on in the short term versus things might, one might wanna spend on in the long term. 
uh, I've put two columns up here. I heard the news today, which is the things that seem to be really prominent in the news right now are the kinds of things that push us toward shorter term spending and even toward the kinds of things that might be more individualized or family based benefits. Things like the fact that the pandemic unemployment benefits are ending, that eviction moratoriums are ending. The, ch the child tax credit supplement expires at the end of the calendar year. That Treasury has been quite slow to deploy emergency rental and homeowner assistance programs and the state small business credit initiative. And other departments and agencies of the federal government have been slow to deploy their programming and their funding underneath the American Rescue Plan Act as well. And more than that, the federal government has been imposing significant bureaucratic burdens that make um, the access to recovery money is difficult, and that's slow too. So all of this is a pressure for shorter term spending and potentially even more um, personal and individualized spending. But that contrasts with much of the news that came out right when the American Rescue Plan Act was passed. In fact, some of the kinds of things that we wrote about at the Harvard Project on American Indian economic development, that these are some of the largest transfers of wealth from the U.S. federal government to Indian country that have ever been seen before. And many folks, um, including us, have suggested that if this kind of spending took place in infrastructure and on other aspects of community and economic development, um, where the thinking was really shifted more toward the longer term and toward collective-based spending, that this could be a major game changer in Indian country, akin to what the Marshall Plan was in the devastated countries um, of the Pacific and Western and Eastern Europe after um, World War II. Can we go to the next slide, please? This means that Native nations are really facing major choices. And I think it helps, and this is what Karen was talking about, about framing up some of the policy dimensions here, is to think a little bit about um, kind of what might be four buckets that funds could be uh, targeted toward. The chart is helpful because it reminds us that there are at least two dimensions that the thing, kinds of things I've been talking about uh, uh, are, are, are spread across. So one of those dimensions is, as I've mentioned, the present versus the future that a lot of this treasury money, a lot of the American Rescue Plan Act monies that are flowing through other departments could be spent right now on, on current and pressing uh, needs that are experienced by uh, Native Nation communities right now. And that could be things like income replacement, uh, per capita distribution payments of other sorts, whether tied to specific needs or not, like rent, housing, and utility assistance, or food assistance, or maybe uncovered healthcare costs, or even school supplies at the, here at the start of the beginning of the school year. Or they could be sunk into future spending, um, which might be things like sovereign wealth funds or college scholarships or down payment assistance. But that present to future isn't just on um, the only dimension in play. And in fact, there's this, I've already started to talk about that secondary dimension, which is the individual versus the collective. Or maybe it's better to think about individual slash family and the collective, the collective being the whole native nation. So the real question here, I think, is how much does your native nation want to put in each of these four buckets? How much does it want to put in that individual and present bucket that includes things like individualized and family-based assistance? How much does it want to put into that collective and present bucket that includes things like support for tribal government operations that allows it to expand some of the critical programming that we know is necessary to respond to the pandemic? Um, like uh, increased uh, funding for things like healthcare or spending right now on critical infrastructure like broadband. How much does the Native nation want to put into the individualized slash family bucket that's focused more on the future, which could be things like um, putting money into down payment uh, uh, grants for citizen home purchases, savings accounts for citizens that will help carry them into older age, or college scholarships that might really change the human capital um, frontier for the nation? And how much does the nation want to put into that fourth bucket, which is collectively focused future spending, um, potentially spending that affects the ability of the tribe to engage in economic diversification that might protect it um, from some of the kinds of hard, deep hits that uh, tribes took during the, um, uh, the pandemic that we're coming out of right now. Um, maybe they want to put, uh, there's an opportunity to establish or add to sovereign wealth funds, which again are like in the same sense that there can be savings accounts for individuals or families. This is sort of that savings account for the nation that helps protect it economically into the land long run. Or even land purchases, which are another kind of 
asset development or asset accumulation that can protect the nation and help the nation into the future as well. So think about that kind of four different buckets. I think oftentimes when we're presented with the kinds of choices that you saw on the previous slide, people think it's a it's an either or or spending only in the present or only in the future. When in reality, it's very useful to think about these four different categories of spending and how much does your nation want to put into each one? Maybe it's as simple as allocating a percentage deep for each bucket, 25% to each of the four, or saying maybe we want to preserve more of this money to the future so that we're, we're pushing aside 60, 70, 80% of the funds into that into the future categories, and maybe even a large proportion into the future collective category. That helps drive better conversations, I think, um, about the the sort of elephant in the room, which is the per capita distributions. So how much do you want to put into that? How much of the this, this grand opportunity do you want to be sinking into that? I think another thing that this chart really emphasizes is that it doesn't have to be an either or, that it is this notion of it can be both and, but that the critical set of decisions is how much into each one of these buckets. Next slide, please. Another piece of decision-making, of course, that tribes have to face is the question of once you decide to, uh, to uh, start to, to spend this money, it's not just future versus present or collective versus um, individual. It also has certain costs that have to be taken into consideration. So these uh, uh, strategic dimensions of revenue distributions also uh, reflect some of the concerns around direct payments like per capitas or other uh, individualized or family-based spending assistance versus longer-term spending um, uh, categories. So this is just one that I've pulled out to give you this example that I think also should feed into Native Nation decision-making. By making direct payments of various sorts, you have to take into account what your Native Nation's administrative capacity is to do that work. You have to take into account that there might be audit possibilities based on significant compliance requirements about the way monies might be spent. And you have to be worried about uh, the kinds of incentives that might be created in your community through uh, dependence or to deter people from pursuing uh, greater investments in their own human capital. On the other hand, there are also costs to thinking about longer term spending, that collective future focused spending. It definitely requires a large investment in strategic planning to get it done right. And if you don't do that kind of strategic planning, you might not really be spending the uh, money in the best ways and the ways that you were hoping to get the kind of kick that you wanted from it. There are significant project management needs to not just make a plan, but to execute that plan and to stay on its path. And there are also deadlines that are associated with the legislation for when money needs to be encumbered and for when projects need to be completed that also have those audit possibilities uh, uh, raising their, their ugly head. So I think that what we boil down to, and on the next slide, there's an image of this, is that it's really all a balance and it's about finding that balance. It's about thinking about how much do you put in distributions now, and maybe in particular into that individual distant, uh, distributions now bucket, because it's absolutely the case that the pandemic has created pressing needs among tribal citizens. And this is an opportunity to, be, to begin to meet them. Um, and then that starts that conversation of how do you minimize the costs associated with that and some of the problems that per capita policies might give rise to. So how much do you wanna put there? Um, and then how do you minimize um, any costs or, or harms associated with that? And then on the other hand, the investments for the long-term. There's no guarantee that this level of spending would ever happen by the US federal government again. So there's some desire to make sure that some money is put there. That's the balancing factor uh, to, to, to secure that um, spending and those resources to, for benefits far into the future, because this could be something like Indian Country's Marshall Plan. Um, but that then also, of course, competes against the short-term needs. I hope by this presentation, I've helped you think about finding that balance for your Native nation and given you some more things to think about in structuring um, that, that balance of individual and family versus collective, present versus future, and those four boxes that come out of that and how much your nation wants to put into each one of them. I've just listed on the last slide just a few resources that you may find useful in thinking about these questions more. These slides will be available in the recording so you can come back to this if you want to do some more reading. Thanks, Karen. Thank you so much, Miriam. That was helpful as we look at 
um, tribes being able to make really kind of thoughtful um, decisions. You're giving them some tools that they can communicate with their citizenry with. And then I'd like to reiterate, there's already discussion at the federal level um, about raising the debt ceiling. Um, the pandemic is ongoing. Um, we're really not sure what's gonna happen economically into the future, both for the country and for Indian country, and whether or not the federal government will have the resources there um, to make some of these investments and tide us over. I also wanted to make one comment that everyone who's listening should note um, that these are tribal leaders um, trying to make good decisions for their nations. Um, they are not legal counsel. Um, they will consult their own legal counsel as they um, develop their plans. Um, so as you are struggling with these issues um, within your community and making those plans, please do consult with legal counsel. Um, none of this information should constitute any kind of legal opinion. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to actually start with um, Chairwoman um, Chavers. Um, so I noticed your community um, really took advantage of the fact that CARES Act had such a short timeline to spend. Mm -hmm. Tribes were just kind of like, okay, how can we get it out the door um, so we don't have to turn it back? And everyone noted that ARPA really gave you some time to be somewhat deliberative. Um, what was the conversation amongst your tribal council in the approach of taking that planning time up front? Um, thank you, Karen. It's very good to be here today. I'm very honored to be uh, able to speak to all of you and with these distinguished guests. Um, I just wanna say that we knew we, that we could not make those decisions by ourselves and that we need our senior management team, which is our, our directors of all our um, programs here, that we need their input as well with regards to what are the needs of some of the programs because they deal with a lot of the, the band members and the, and the clients and people they serve. So we meet weekly as a, as a team to discuss uh, projects that they've brought forward for um, the ARPA funding. We realize too that it's gonna take a while to spend these uh, dollars because uh, we do have more time than we did with the CARES Act. So with that, uh, we have a, a very good team concept and then we kind of reached out to the community to say, hey, what do you guys want? Um, and uh, that's kind of where we were at with the beginning of the ARPA. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, President Killer, um, what was the process that your tribal council went through in terms of making some initial decisions regarding your nation's use of ARPA funds? Um, thank you, Karen. It's good to see you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay good deal. Um, yeah, good to see you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I shake your hands with a warm and good heart. My Lakota name is Close to Earth, and English name is Kevin Killer. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I think one of the biggest things is that I was, you know, when I came in, um, it was kind of on the end of, uh, you know, as, as the previous chairwoman was talking about, of uh, the CARES Act funding and the restrictions and all that kind of stuff that came with it. And then you almost, you know, you change administrations and you, you get a whole different, a whole different world to you on how, you know, they, they look at asset building, wealth building, you know, recovery, all this kind of stuff. And so it was kind of like night and day, you know, I mean, when I got into it, because I, I, you know, I stepped away from state politics for about two years and I was, you know, ran for, you know, I just ran on a, uh, ran because of the religious commitment that I had and, you know, I ended up in this position, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, you, you know, coming into this, you see, you know, you're able to kind of, you know, have a 20,000 foot view. And when you actually get into it, you, you begin to understand, okay, this is what they could have done. This is what could have happened. But our, but basically our council, you know, was deliberating at, at first what the amount was, you know, I'm trying to figure out you know, how much each tribe was going to be allocated. And then you, then, um, you know, we, we ran it through one of our numbers people who, um, who, you know, just researches this, you know, he, he just got out and then he came and gave us an estimate before everybody else. So we kind of had a, you know, preview of what was going to come out based on what was given out in the guidance. And, and, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, I, I think like the number that they gave us was so, you know, just, you know, we couldn't believe it. It was just like, wow, somebody's actually going to invest this much resources into our community, and you know, there's there's not going to be a lot of stipulations around this. Um, and then, you know, how do we actually, you know, what is the long term look on that? Because I think 
a lot of it is is uh, you know a lot of uh, you know this the decision making process that exists within you know federal funding and all this kind of stuff. It, it's it's based around scarcity, and you know to have this aspect that's not based in scarcity, but to actually take a longer view on how do you really build rebuild something. Um, it was really getting our council members to wrap their minds around that. So I think that was probably the biggest thing is just deliberating and say, okay. And then the whole conversation happened with the individual payments. And so that kind of led to another conversation. And that was really interesting to see how um, that was kind of handled internally. Because I think a lot of people, as Mariam was saying, on the scale that you had, the quadrants, you know, there were some people that were in the first quadrant. There's some people who were in the second quadrant, uh, people in the third and fourth quadrants, you know. And, you know, that's totally understandable because people are coming at it from all different levels. You know, some of our older tribal council members were uh, saying that this is a one-time investment, you know, and you had some of the younger ones actually saying that, well, let's put it into some youth funding, you know, and you had some some middle, you know, some of the, the more experienced ones saying that, well, we need to give something back to the community. Um, so it was, you know, a range on a whole different, uh, a lot of opinions, but we ultimately just, you know, had those conversations, you know, and one of the unfortunate parts about where, you know, with COVID and all that, we, we, it was hard to get public input. You know, the best way to do that was actually through uh, Facebook. And sometimes Facebook's good and bad, you know, like someday, you know, most of the time I'm having uh, bad Facebook days, but that's okay. I mean, that comes comes with the territory, but, um, but you know, it, it's, you know, I just, I just say that jokingly, but at the same time, it, it's one of the um, best ways to kind of get a, um, a feel for what people are actually saying, you know, so this, having public forums, you know, putting some stuff out there to say, okay, well, what do people feel about that? And then seeing what the comments were, that was kind of the, the, the best level of feedback that we had. So. President Killer, what kinds of things um, did your community identify as priorities? You mentioned youth programs as well as per capita. Did anything surprise you? Um, you mean, I think, you know, the, 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 the you know, with COVID coming through and, you know, I think it exposed a lot of uh, things that were broken or magnified it in certain ways, um, especially around mental health. And that was probably like one of the biggest areas where not really surprising, but, you know, just seeing how, uh, what was surprising to see how much we were lacking around mental health, you know, and how it impacted into every single one of these programs that, you know, because our tribe, we have, I believe it's 62 tribal programs. And so, you know, having an area that big, you know, we're just trying to figure out, okay, how does, how did COVID impact every single one of these around mental health? And what is the long-term effects of that? And we're still seeing that. And I think one of the biggest things is just making sure that, you know, we're, we're uh, looking at community responsive areas that, you know, when, when we do invest some of this money that we have, have coming, and that we, that's here, um, it's like how we're going to take in that mental health aspect. And that's a good conversation. You know, before I think it was just kind of like this, um, this uh, scarcity approach of where we'll just take what we can get rather than advocating for what you actually need. And, you know, that's one of the biggest things that, you know, like just talking with wealth advisors and all this kind of stuff is, is you know, don't budget for what you have, budget for what you need. You know, so if you have this much money, but your project costs this much now that you have money to do something actually work towards that you know and i think that was like uh, just helping people to kind of you know within our community on um, council you know understand that is that you know hey uh you know we're coming to this table not with our handout but you know at the same time we're coming to this table with, as an equal partner into you know coming to the you know saying okay well if we're going to build something we can put capital into these projects you know we don't have to worry about um, you know, like, you know, pulling pennies and trying to find, find all this stuff, you know, so it's, uh, so it's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Chairwoman Chavers, um, we discussed this previously that, you know, it seems like a lot of money, but when you start talking infrastructure, mm -hmm. millions doesn't really go far. Um, you know, when you're talking sewer and, and roads and buildings, mm -hmm. um, things like that. And, I think people get a little sticker shock when they say the tribe is getting how much. Um, and so it puts them in a different mindset. Tell me a little bit about how your conversations went with your community in terms of, you know, prioritizing what was important, what was the reality of your allocation so that you could help guide them in their thinking. 
Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, basically, what happened is when we first contacted, and we've only really contacted our tribal members through um, social media or um, emails or um, face our website uh, and ask for written comments. And so right now with our with our senior management, we are getting those projects uh, listed. But um, we also are at this point getting the um, RFPs together because our, our strategic planning is at the end of its cycle. And so it's a good time for us to start that. Um, with regards to our tribal members, we know that the first priority was our tribal members. Um, you know, helping them uh, monetarily with a, a direct payment. And so um, that part was, you know, finding that amount that we wanted to do, uh, especially when we have other tribes around us that are giving larger amounts. And of course, they're probably larger tribes than us, and, and we are a smaller tribe. But that was our priority. But once we get this, uh, we did put an RFP out for a strategic planner now uh, to come in because of the ARPA funding to, because we have, uh, I think we've come up with over like 200 projects. And of course, we know that our money won't, won't go that far because we're, we're a small tribe. And so, uh, you know, what we're going to do is be um, putting a, together a plan that we're going to put forward to our tribal members for them to prioritize what they feel is the need for the community and for the band members. However, the direct assist pay, assistance payments are just in the process of being done now. So that was priority one. Um, the other thing we had was emergent needs. Um, here at Boys Fort, uh, we have a wild rice lake and uh, uh, our community knows that our dam is failing for our lake. And um, we've had low water levels this year. And so um, lack of rain and, and mother nature, but uh, it did expose some very, um, uh, bad uh, um, issues with our dam where it probably would not last another winter. And so um, we are doing that emergency. What's, what's, emer what's emergent? What do we need to get done right away that we can get done because um, this dam, like for example, will not last another year. So that they're good with that. They really, cause that, that's our wild rice, our, our subsist, our food. Um, that's who we are. We, we love our wild rice and we, we use that. So um, we have those priorities emergent and then the direct assistance. And then we will be going to the tribal members once we get our strategic plan done with the ARPA funding projects and bring it forward to them at that point. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, Chairman Butler, so, you know, in terms of balancing those different buckets that Miriam talked about, um, you know, your tribe had to do that even before ARPA funds and CARES Act funds, and you saw kind of some upsides and downsides um, to direct relief payments, and that may have affected how you viewed this kind of opportunity with ARPA. Can you talk a little bit about your tribe's history um, with direct distributions per capita um, and how that affected your decision making this time? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Karen. Um, and let me start off by saying we can start with a, saying, one, come on. uh, from Mash and Tucket. And, um, you know, when, when Mary was speaking, it really was bringing me back almost, uh, you know, 10 plus years um, when we went through the financial crisis and it, it hit us pretty hard here at Mash and Tucket. Um, and we had some planning in place, but we weren't fully prepared for that to the sense that uh, the level that we were impacted. And it forced us to do a lot of uh, long range planning that we hadn't done in the past. Uh, we focused on a strategic plan, a 10 year plan. Uh, it really started to focus on more so uh, less on the direct distributions and really truly nation building. Um, and when the, the four core buckets that, that the quadrants that Marion had highlighted, I mean, that was literally what we were doing uh, almost, almost actually almost 15 years ago now. Um, and so when this, when COVID hit, uh, ironically, we were actually in an update of our strategic plan. We were in a process to update our strategic plan. And so that was very helpful and beneficial as we started to receive the first uh, round of, of CARES Act funding and now moving into the ARP funding. Um, and, and previously, uh, we were heavily distribution weighted. Uh, we actually call it an incentive program. It was, it was a glorified per capita program. Uh, there were certain incentives that we're trying to, it was good intentions, right? Just similar to the, to, to the road to some places we built with good intentions. 
Um, you know, it was all about encouraging employment, encouraging education and the like. And at some point, politics and gaming the system came into play and it became purely a distribution program um, that really put us in a bind. And so we were fortunate enough at the time and back in 08 to be able to, uh, to slowly wean ourselves off of that. And we transitioned from a direct distribution program to more services uh, and, and you know, employment uh, supplements. Uh, we built in a, uh, a retirement program for our elders community. We built a disability, a disability program. So basically built in all the social safety nets, take care of people that as, as they were transitioning from the per capita. At the same time, we were building up reserve accounts uh, so that if something like 2008 happened again, uh, we'd be ready for it. And I will say it actually worked better than planned uh, when we had our COVID shutdown uh, back in 20, uh, 2020. Um, you know, all of us were in a, ca a cast crunch. The CARES Act hadn't passed yet, and, and we were trying to maintain our, our large facilities we have here was a small small reservation uh, and a small population. Uh, we, are, we have a large economic engine here at Foxwoods, and so to maintain that, we actually had to dip into the tribes reserve accounts that you know prior to 2008 we never had set up. Um, but because we were planning and thinking about what we had just gone through at that time, we made sure that we were focused on making sure that those 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 safety nets were there not only for the individual tribal members but for the community at large. Uh, and it really, it really helped out. Um, and so as far as moving forward, though, with, with ARPA, and again, what uh, President Killer was, say, was saying and uh, Jeremy Chavers was saying, you know, we did similar where we actually did a, a community a needs assessment uh, early on. And we were thinking about once the guidance came out, we, we ran the numbers as well and started thinking, well, if we got within a certain range of ARPA, what would we do with it? How would we spend it and how would we allocate it? Uh, directly to the to the tribal members, the tribal citizens, but also for long range planning. Um, and so we were fortunate enough to build that plan and we're still fine tuning it now. We just actually had a session with our tribal elders just last week, walking through that plan and saying, how can we build for today, uh, but most importantly, secure the future for generations to come. It sounds like some of your lessons learned from previously were, um, build that social safety net, um, but make sure you're also for the collective, making sure that safety net is also for your government and your absolutely. enterprises. You, you absolutely have to balance it. We were so weighted to the individual prior to, that's what got us into trouble. Um, and so we, we learned from that uh, as we talk about from people all the time, it's our people have perseverance. We, we figure it out and we, we find a way to, to, to make it through. Um, and we did that in through, through, through COVID as well. It was beautiful to see how the community came together and, and understood where we're at. Even with this new funding coming in, that experience of what we had been through, even from the elders, it wasn't a clearing for let's do immediate distributions. I mean, there's a portion of financial assistance that, uh, that's necessary, but they were encouraging as well as how do we, how do we plan for uh, the future generations? You know, it's interesting because people who aren't familiar with inter Indian country don't know how incredibly culturally competent making sure that we take care of our community is, right? I mean, this goes back to, you know, our ancestors. I remember my parents saying, you know, if someone had a car, everybody got a ride. You know, if somebody had a windfall, everybody ate. And we bring a lot of that, those values into contemporary decision-making, um, but with a lot more responsibility, right? Um, because our, our enterprises, like you said, uh, Chairman Butler, we're drivers of local economies. You know, we draw in employees from large swaths of, in many cases, rural America, and we have a duty to them too, right? Um, you know, our healthcare systems are dependent on our, our health insurance that we're providing for our employees. Um, President Killer, um, when you are engaging with your council, you know, how are you talking about taking care of the tribe collectively, as well as stitching up those holes that might be there in the social safety net for your tribal citizens? Um, you know, I think it, a lot of it, I mean, I'm not sure how big, uh, you know, Chairman Butler or Chairman Chambers is councils, we have 21 members, so that's, you know, it's a little bit bigger, so it's really managing, uh, yeah, personality, you see all the stuff, but, um, you know, but I, I think part of it, too, is, is just, you know, meeting, 
like some of the committees where they're at, all that kind of stuff, and, and just you know sharing with them that you know there's other options too. Because one of the the the, the things that came out with especially ARP was there's a lot lot of opportunities for grant funding um, that can be applied competitively and all this kind of stuff. So making sure that you know even if your your needs can't be met individually as a council person, you know there is a, there's this grant out there, or there's this funding opportunity, or there's this. I mean, there's ways to access resources that weren't there before. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things is making sure that, you know, you look at, you, you know, even with this, it, it's like you have to have your own individual person basically turning over every single stone in, um, in, in these, uh, you know, in the, uh, the relief funds that came out, you know, so that basically that whatever that amount was that came out to everybody, there were so many provisions in there that and that was really, you know, historic as, as, was mentioned previously by Miriam was that you know this was like a unique opportunity of where you know tribal members are included but that you know also what you know forced us to advocate to members of congress like Sharice Davids um you know Tom Cole you know finding all our partners um and really leveraging you know our relationships at the senate level and making sure that we uh, you know were part of those conversations so that meant navigating you know talking with Senator Sanders um, you know, his staff and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, Senator Warren, you know, visiting with her, you know, with her about some of the teams and making sure that we were part of, you know, that, that we were pushing that conversation at every single level. So when we, you know, so when the, when the final bill came out, you've seen so many provisions for Native communities, but even with that, it's just like, you know, when you're doing wealth building, it's such a new, con you know, well, for us anyway, it's like, it's a, a different way to look at it, you know, especially if we're trying to, you know, uh, you know, just basically we're used to, you know, making barely making ends meet to having access to a lot of wealth. It's a different mindset, you know, so. You know, President Killer, you bring up something to mind for me during the first recession, um, as referenced by Chairman Butler, you know, there were shovel ready projects, right, to help us get through that, um, that recession. And, you know, tribes have got drawers full of projects that they have wanted through the years, um, you know, and they pick through them one by one, right, as opportunity and funding comes along. But but Indian country shined during that time. Um, we were able to go out to Washington and say, look at how efficiently, how fast and how meaningful we were able to deliver with appropriate funding levels. And I think that Indian country really gave Congress the tools they need to advocate for us this time because we were just enormously competent and community responsive um, under that previous funding. Um, we're going to need to collect these stories again, um, because you know how it is, you know, one tribe does one thing wrong and it's front page news, right? Um, and then they paint us all with the same brush. But the resilience and the creativity and the entrepreneurship of Indian country is a part of the reason we survive, right? And thrive. Um, are there any, do any of you have any notions about like, you've got this cool thing that's happening or has the potential to be prioritized within your community. I mean, how are you going to message back to policymakers um, and Congress about the fact that these investments make a difference in our communities? Does, do, do any of you have some thoughts on that? Hmm. Not, maybe you're not there yet in terms of decision-making. <laughs> Because well, direct direct relief isn't going to get you more, right? No, um, right? That that was band aid on the immediate problem, but it's not the cure for our community. In fact, um, you know, President Killer mentioned it. We did a whole webinar on mental health services and the need to look at that really expansively, right? Um, and access. Um, it, Part of it is our values and really communicating and removing the stigma around mental health, but it's also access, telehealth, um, having our own providers who understand our communities. Um, it's whole family care, um, not just acute care for mental illness. So a lot of tribes are looking at that innovatively in terms of how do we deal with mental health issues. And of course, you know, we're dealing with the centuries up until now aggravated by a pandemic, right? Um, so anyway, that's, I was just kind of thinking about, you know, is anything coming up in your communities that you're thinking, wow, that's a super good idea. Well, um, I, I, I would add, Karen, if I could, and, and kind of sure. a 
between what President Killer and uh, Truman uh, Chavers were, were saying about uh, about the capital side of this. I mean, we, we quickly did a capital assessment of in infrastructure projects looking out, you know, five to, to 10 years uh, and easily exceeded the amount of money that we received from the ARP. And so it shifted our focus to, to think about from an infrastructure perspective, you know, the infrastructure bill is, is moving. Um, there are, uh, there's some language in there for, for, for tribes and we just have to be diligent and not just sit and be happy with what we just got from the ARP. It is, it is really is, it's, it's transformational what we receive, but there's another opportunity that, that's coming forward that we need to make sure that the language is there that, that benefits us and gives us the flexibility to reinvest in the infrastructure that we see on our reservations. And, and you pointed it out, some of them might not just be roads and bridges and the like, there's mm -hmm. other community infrastructure projects that go to mental health um, and, mm -hmm. and, and behavioral health and the like. And so um, again, I just, that's where we've started to, to refocus on um, pushing the, the, the legislators on that infrastructure bill and, and making sure that it's just as effective for Indian country as ARP is. Um, Karen, if I might add something, um, I'd like to say also that, um, you know, we as tribes have dealt with limited funding for centuries, for many years, whatever you want to say. And that's why we do so well with the funding that we get. And this time it's like, it's Christmas for tribes and uh, we've never ever really gotten this amount of money. And so I think that by us having that smaller amount of funding that we've learned to stretch as far as we can with what we've got. Um, and then also from that is taking the cultural component um, of the tribes that um, for healing and for um, the mental health aspect, uh, how we care for each other, how we take care of our elders, how we take care of our youth. Um, I think we'll shine in that area because I know like here at, at my tribe at Boys Fort, um, we're really focusing on like the mental health. Uh, there's no mental health providers around in our state that uh, really do any type of men management. We're looking probably down the road of uh, a possible, who knows, probably not in my lifetime here, but I'm kind of getting up there, uh, but you know, uh, a mental health facility, um, which does med management for tribal people. Um, we don't have those here in the state. We don't have enough mental health facilities or mental health providers to help with the issues that are coming. And of course there's tons more money coming for mental health, but we need the people to provide those services. And we, we as the caring people we are know how to do that already because we've been doing it for generations and we're just getting smarter at how to do it um, than other people. And I think that's one thing that we'll, we'll shine on um, through this pandemic because we've already shown we can vaccinate more people um, by the efforts we've done. We've done mobile units here to get our people vaccinated. Um, we've, we've made great strides, but it's not over yet. And so we, we know we still have an ongoing issue with the pandemic and um, we'll, we'll keep fighting and we'll be ready. President Killer, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, I mean, I think it's gonna take all of us, you know, on the call and, you know, people watching and all that kind of stuff, you know that there's a, a certain interest out there that does watch this and, you know, making sure that that we're always, you know, um, you know, not not forgotten, you know, and I think that's probably the biggest thing is that, you know, this this money is really, you know, helping us, you know, realize that, you know, we it helps us realize to see where everything, where we just need more resources, you know, and really understanding that, um, you know, we need to work together. I think that's probably one of the biggest things that, you know, I really applaud everyone, and, you know, the chairs on the call and the ones who are watching and all that is that, you know, every single message was almost the same when you were on every single treasury call, you know, it's kind of like, we need this, we need that, you know, we need, you know, this needs to be flexible and needs to, and, you know, and sure enough, it all came out, but, you know, we're in a really unique um, kind of uh, situation in terms of politics is where, you know, you have a 50 plus one majority in the Senate and, um, you know, but you have to work with the other side of the aisle, you know, because you still need those other votes. And for us, you know, we have to work with Senator Brown and Senator Thune, um, you know, and it's just important that, you know, we, and, and they're, they're realizing that this is really important. And I think for us, it, it's really looking at 
broadband. And that's one of the exciting areas that we're kind of looking at building out because we have a lot of land mass. And I think one of the most exciting things that came out of this whole conversation was us actually, you know, reaching out to Cheyenne River, us reaching out to Rosebud, because we knew they had, you know, an extra wealth. And, and, you know, there was a possibility of us, you know, forming a collaboration, you know, where we can actually, you know, leverage our broadband, leverage our, you know, leverage our economic resources to kind of be, uh, you know, even more stronger in this area, you know, and, and, it, and it helped us, it's helping us form some unique alliances that weren't there before. So I think that's one of the biggest things is just making sure that we're always, um, as Chairwoman Chamber said, is that, you know, we're healing, um, you know, and this is, you know, and anything that's, that's based in healing, we need to be strong and push that conversation forward because, you know, we know the needs, we know all this stuff of, of, uh, that, that's been hurting us. And, and um, you know, we, we can really help lead that conversation because I think a lot of people in this country just in general are, are really, you know, they, they've gone through COVID themselves and they've seen the impact that it's going to have on their own families. And we've been dealing with that for generations after generations after loss, like sudden loss, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we, we kind of have a handle on how to handle crises, you know, for better or worse and all that yeah. stuff. Oh, that's a good thing or bad thing, but, you know, that, that, I guess I'll just stop there. You know, President Killer, you bring to my mind that, um, you know, we've learned that we don't necessarily, especially for tribes who rely heavily on gaming, um, that we don't have economic resiliency. We've learned that they are fragile. Um, they used to be recession proof. Now we know that's not true. We've had recessions where they're not, uh, where they're impacted greatly. Now we have, um, you know, a health crisis um, and hospitality, you know, was hit hard and gaming was hit hard. Um, and then we're having to deal with things like climate change and natural disasters. Um, you know, Chairwoman Chavers has had um, wildfires up by her. You know, there's flooding going on. Um, and all of these things are going to continue. I mean, let's just be honest. And so some of the conversations about Miriam's, you know, kind of four buckets is we don't know what's next or when. Um, so one of the things that my tribe has been trying to do Fond du Lac is um, buy from other tribes or tribal members as we provide assistance to our tribe, like wild rice, maple syrup to put in food baskets for our elders and our community members. So those, um, you know, agricultural producers have some revenue coming in, but it was also buying from Ponca. Um, you know, they have um, a meat produce, bison as well as um, beef. And so they were sourcing from other tribes. This is beyond the kind of per cap versus long-term investment. But I think you know, if we buy Indian from each other and prioritize, what do you think that can do to help maybe mitigate some of the risk? And how do we get something like that going? Do you have any thoughts? Oh, they're all jumping right in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, look, well, I, mean, I know I know Net Lake has wild rice. They yeah. say theirs is the best in the country. It is. It is the best in the country. I'll say that. Um, yeah. We, we've participated in various uh, procurement initiatives with other, with sister nations, um, some successful, some not. And, you know, so many of them fall by the way of politics, which is unfortunate. You see that a lot in Indian country and there's got to, we have to figure out a way to get around our own insecurities with that. We'd rather deal with outsiders and deal with our own for some reason. Um, and that's something that, that's been, you know, conditioned in us through, through generations, um, not only to, to not trust the federal government, we don't trust ourselves and we need to build up that confidence from within. And I think, uh, I think Karen, as you pointed out, the more that we can buy from each other, we can start to build that confidence um, and build those diverse revenue streams and really kind of balance out and diversify our economies. Um, it, you know, gaming has been an amazing blessing uh, for, for many of us um, and oil and gas has been for others um, and, and several other opportunities, but you can't, you can't count on that one thing, right? There's always some sort of economic uh, boom and bust that's going to hit us if we just focused on one. And, um, and again, learning from what we did 15 years ago, we actually set up a separate endowment trust. And so that we would slowly put, just like your individual retirement accounts, we did that for the tribe. And we're slowly building up this trust fund 
that at some point we're not going to have to worry about whether you know we did great in, in August at, at Foxwoods or you know December is the doldrums of the winter, right? Because it's going to be steadied out with an income stream that we can count on. And it's not something I'm going to see in, in, in my lifetime. And I knew that when we were setting it up. But the reality is we're not thinking, you know, just as lifetime in this generation. Again, we've talked about this frequently, how we're thinking in, in many years ahead. I think President, President Killer touched on that, just about how we've dealt with, with hardships and tragedy. Um, you know, no one has been through more th than we have. And I think that's shown through brightly. When dealing with COVID, I mean, all, when you looked across the grants and you saw what tribes were doing in advance of what the states or local municipalities were doing, I mean, it, it just, it was, it was so amazing and inspiring to see how we were leading uh, the advance of, of keeping people safe and reopening and taking care of our community members and taking care of our employees. Uh, I mean, at Mash and Tuck, we were able to give uh, vaccinations to our employees months before they were able to get it throughout the state. And to this day, we still get you know, the thank yous for that and just the appreciation. And again, that, that story was, was, you know, all across the country and seeing how tribes were, were treating not only their communities, but the surrounding communities as well. So something for us all to be proud of. And Karen, if I might add, yes. uh, if I might add uh, that, um, you know, here in uh, Minnesota, uh, we have 11 tribes and we have partnerships and collaborations between each other. I, I've never seen it where it's been so cohesive um, I mean, we were having weekly calls during the pandemic uh, with regards to what each tribe was doing. We called each other about when we were going to close our casinos. I mean, but we did it collaboratively and together. And we can do that, too, with the resources they have, like, say, with the buffalo, uh, the buffalo meat down in the, the Dakotas. I mean, you know, so and the rice that we have and uh, the sage and the, the, all that, you know, the sweet grass and um we can do that together. And in Minnesota, we have that relationship within all 11 tribes. Uh, it's not about just boys fort, it's about all the tribes. So I think that helps a lot when you have that um, partnership like uh, President Keller, Killer mentioned earlier with that uh, consolidation of some tribes uh, over in the Dakotas. Um, that helps a lot because we can help each other with each other's resources. And I think President Killer brought up a great point about broadband. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can run it as a utility, you can run it as an enterprise, um, you can do open fiber um, and let providers bid on it and pay you um, to run your broadband for you. So you don't, you know, if you don't have those technical experts in the house and it would be hard for you to, to build them out. Um, but that's another huge investment. And if we're going to weather the next economic um, hurdles, um, and we, we know this for our children, for telehealth, for all kinds of reasons, broadband is a utility um, mm -hmm. and, and we need to bring that to our citizens. So um, NTIA, NTIA um, and others are having a coming um, guidance sessions on those um, funds that are coming out, um, President Killer. So I hope that you're able to um, take advantage of those so you can bring those resources in your community. Additionally, um, it was brought up in the chat that um, USET, um, United South and Eastern Tribes has a tribal enterprise directory. Um, that they put out for their um, region. So if you're looking um, for vendors, um, tribes to purchase from and circulate that money within our economies, they have that resource available. Um, and of course there are um, others out there. It was also brought up um, that the state of Minnesota was awfully great um, in terms of, of course we have Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan who mm -hmm. actually recognized that tribal citizens are also citizens of the state of Minnesota yep. and maybe there are state responsibilities to bear. And we know that not all tribes um, enjoy that position um, in terms of good relations with their state. We didn't previously. Um, so we are grateful for Governor Waltz and Lieutenant Governor um, Flanagan for making sure that the state was a partner with tribes. Yep. Are there any closing thoughts that um, any of you would like to share regarding um, ARPA and responding to community and decision-making economy 
Any other things we touched upon? I'd like to reiterate what President Killer was saying about uh, one, planning, but two, not only looking at ARPA, start to look at all the other grant opportunities that are included mm -hmm. in ARPA, not just the direct distribution of tribes. We actually went through and highlighted every single possible grant and had a team that were screening through, you know, what, what can help support some of our services? What, you know, what infrastructure projects can be done outside of the direct distributions that we're receiving? And there's, there's a lot of money out there. We're actually, one of them that we just got notification on today was part of our language rec uh, reclamation program. And there was funding for tribal languages and preservation and protection of those. And so, uh, you know, th there's a long list of opportunity that, uh, that is available and everyone should be taking full advantage of that. Um, my last words, Karen, I guess I'd like to say is that, you know, from listening even to the, the previous Harvard project uh, um, uh, um, sessions you've had, uh, we have done RFPs for grant writers to access those other funds that are available because there is a lot of money out there. We have put out RFPs for investing some of that money to see how we can get more money off money, you know what I mean? Um, the other thing is that uh, we actually um, did do a, a, a direct payment, but we've done one so far. And it was a, a minimal amount, not what our band members really wanted, but it's out there, but we're um, keeping the door open that we will probably do more than one. Um, so if you do small ones to begin with, uh, you can do more than, because we don't know how long this is gonna last. And we don't know if there's gonna be any other distributions. So, um, you know, if we invest, if we get as much money and use the BIA, IHS, those program dollars before the ARPA, um, it will last longer and hopefully be better for community members and communities. Absolutely, President Keller. Um, you know, I, I, you know, thank you again for uh, you know Chairman Diver, Chairman Shapers, Chairman Butler for your leadership in your communities. And, um, you know, I, the only thing that kind of comes to me that they didn't already say was, you know, I think thinking back that you know just as the original Indigenous people to this land. You know, not to forget spirituality and how that kind of guides our, our decision making and you know or how we you know you know that that kind of we have that you know i think a lot of communities in the nation you know either never you know did uh you know this this look to us again you know for that prayer and that responsibility and you know we have the unique opportunity to offer that as well and it's just important that you know we we don't stray from those values because that's what's going to get us through this and it's, and it's going to help us in the future and it's going to help us make the most of our resources you know so with that i just say thank you again for having us and you know appreciate you reach out and uh highlight the overall street tribe well thank you so much um to each of you for being here today and you know kind of sharing your deliberations and processes um the goal of this series of um arpa um, that we've been putting on is really just to kind of highlight, you know, the breadth of Indian country and of the responsibility we have and the fact that we really do look at it differently. Um, you know, it isn't a one size fits all. We do try to stitch that safety net for our community. We do recognize that, you know, what we were going through really exacerbated, you know, a lot of that kind of ongoing trauma that we brought to the community. I mean, we were missing our funerals, we were missing family events, we were missing, we were protecting our grandparents and so we were staying away. Um, and those things hurt and caused um, harm, but at the same time, then people had all this economic anxiety in addition to health anxiety. And what we were getting from the federal government um, as you know, tribal leaders was, you know, um, not timely, not always accurate, not always a fully baked idea. They were coming out with rules after tribes were already spending the money. So the goal of this series was really to be as value add as possible, to keep our finger on the pulse of what are the regulations and um, to give tribes options, to hear what each other is doing, share those best practices, share what's not a best practice. Don't do that one. That one might not be a good idea, right? Um, and, and that's how we've always gotten through things, right? Um, you know, by caretaking for one another and collectively the tribes have been participating in this. 
So I just want to let everybody know in this last of the series that all of these videos are available on the Ash Center YouTube channel, as well as the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development websites, any other materials that were provided and um, or that we know about for reading materials will also be posted along um, with these videos. And those are it's HPAI ed.edu. Did I spell that right? There it is. No, no. <laughs> no, hpaied.org, not edu. Um, so apologize for that. Um, please note this. And then thank you to all of you and to all of the tribal leaders on the call, tribal executives, and especially our panelists and the staff at the Harvard Project. Um, we thank you for joining us, and we hope that this has brought value to you and your communities. Thank you. Have a good day.